And now, the winner of the 2016 Randolph Caldecott Medal for the most distinguished picture book for children is Sophie Blackall. For Finding Winnie, the true story of the world's most famous bear. Written by Lindsay Maddock. <laughs> Published by Little Brown and Company, a division of Hachette Book Group. <laughs> Edited by Susan Rich, editor at large. <laughs> Designed by Saho Fuji, art director, and Dave Kaplan, creative director. <laughs> From the forests of Canada to the pages of the Hundred Acre Wood, Finding Winnie is an incredible account of the friendship and love shared between a soldier and the real bear who inspired Winnie the Pooh. Beautifully interpreting this multi-dimensional story in her distinctive Chinese ink and watercolor art, Sophie Blackall paints intimate moments set against the sweeping arc of history with authenticity and heart. Whether she uses breathtaking double page spreads our delicate sepia-toned vignettes, she captivates us all. Winnie's enchanting journey is a visual tour de force. I'm sorry, I lost a section. All right, I'm holding you all in suspense. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Sophie, <laughs> it is my great honor <laughs> on behalf of the 2016 Caldecott Committee to acknowledge your distinguished artistic achievement and to present you with the Randolph Caldecott Medal for Finding Winnie, the true story of the world's most famous bear. Goodness, I've got all my goods and chattels. Um, there you are. <laughs> there they are. I know, I know you said you'd be here, but, but you're actually here, which is really, really lovely. All right, in the words of, of Kate DiCamillo, I wrote a speech. Um, <clears throat> what about a story, said Christopher Robin. What about a story, I said. Could you very sweetly tell Winnie the Pooh one? I suppose I could, I said. What sort of stories does he like? About himself, because he's that sort of bear. I am also that sort of bear, and I'm going to be telling you stories mostly about myself. <laughs> 16 years ago, I won a green card in the lottery, which allowed me and my family to immigrate from Australia to America. When my green card was first issued, it listed my nationality as French Polynesian, and <laughs> my occupation as an um, entertainer. <laughs> the nine months I had to wait for a replacement card were passed in fear of being discovered as a fraud on both fronts. I'm half waiting for someone to say apologetically that this whole Caldecott thing was a bureaucratic bungle. So I'm going to speak quickly. <clears throat> Thank you to the 2016 Caldecott Committee your collective expertise and years of preparation, the thousands of hours you spent poring over picture books, your dedication and commitment, all give me faith that there was no bungle. 
and I am overwhelmed with gratitude. <coughs> Thank you for the work that you do to connect children with books that will change their lives and for calling on a dark winter morning and changing mine. I will remember the sound of our mingled laughing and crying for as long as I live. Right, from now on it's just going to be all jokes. <laughs> Thank you for finding, choosing, Winnie, and last stop on Market Street, and for choosing, did I say for cho finding, choosing, Winnie? That was wrong. Thank you for choosing, finding, Winnie, and last stop on Market Street, and trombone shorty, and voice of freedom, and waiting, Christian, Brian, Aqua, Kevin, I am deeply honored to be in your company, and it is humbling to share the stage with Matt LaPena and Jerry Pinckney. I'm inspired every day by the work of my fellow writers and artists. I'm fortunate to live in Brooklyn, which has a disproportionate population <laughs> of children's bookmakers, and even more fortunate to share a studio with some of the best of them. Brian Floker, Edward Hemingway, John Bemelmans Marciano, and Sergio Ruzia. We share not only the physical space, a grimy loft in an old factory near the stagnant waters of the Gowanus Canal, <laughs> but also our ups and downs, advice, and gossip. We share reference books, recipes, long nights, pen nibs, outrage, archives, painkillers, dark chocolate, sightings of our resident Kestrel, and almost every day, lunch. <laughs> I know my work is better for their company. I know Finding Winnie was better for their input and I know how lucky I am. We were together when the awards were announced, and they are all here tonight, and I wouldn't be here without them. And I kind of want them to stand up. Would you stand up? <laughs> right? All right, enough about them. <laughs> I understand that the committee must consider each book in isolation from an artist's previous books, but for me, they and their publishers are all connected. Chronicle, Henry Holt, FSG, Candlewick, Dutton, Athenaeum, Abrams, I know it's starting to get embarrassing, Workman, Putnam, Viking, Schwartz and Wade. Thank you for trusting me for your encouragement and support and friendship. To every editor who ever took a chance on a new illustrator, in my case, Victoria Rock at Chronicle, you will always be our first love and we will always be grateful. To everyone at Little Brown, thank you for gathering behind Finding Winnie like a tidal wave. It was a phenomenal effort from every department Megan, Melanie, Saho, Dave, Jenny, Christina, Jessica, Danielle, and the inimitable Victoria Stapleton. <laughs> this award belongs to all of us. All the same, I'm glad the medal has my name on it. <laughs> when we were kids, my oldest brother, older brother, and you have the one, uh, had a silver christening mug with his name on it. Even though he was no more christened than I was, we were both heathens. <laughs> I had no such mug, and I may have mentioned this oversight once or 50 times to my mother when I was around eight and seething with life's injustices. One day my mother, fed up, went to the local thrift store, came back with a christening mug, and plonked it down in front of me. There, she said, triumphant, Trevor, said the mug in Edwardian script. I have this mug and <laughs> I had an idea that someone might put some wine in it for me. They, they have wine down there and I'm going to give that to, to, to Matt. They'll pass it back to me. I'll have water in the meantime so it's better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. That's lovely. It's not going to be that long, I promise you. <clears throat> I was completely, utterly satisfied with this mug. I embraced it wholeheartedly, but I often wondered what happened to Trevor. <laughs> Trevor, cheers. Trevor marked the beginning with my obsession with old things, especially enigmatic things like an unfinished cross-stitch, home sweet... Oh. <laughs> 
or a porcelain doll with one hand carved wooden arm. It's not so much the things, though I love the things, as the stories they hold, stories that connect us to the past. I forage for the stories of other people's treasures too, a dust bowl baby's shoe made from the skin of a rat, the last stick an old dog laid at his owner's feet, a father and son's dog tags thought lost, discovered entwined in a drawer. So you can imagine Lindsay Mattock's box of mementos made my heart skip a beat, a box of photographs and diaries revealing piece by piece a profound friendship between her great-grandfather and the orphaned black bear he named Winnipeg, Winnie for short. I am so thankful to Lindsay for sharing her story. It was an honor to bring it to life. Winnie the Pooh was the first book I bought with my own money. It was an old, worn edition, a prop in my mother's antique shop. I read it in my secret spot under a table. I used to hide the book so nobody would buy it. Eventually, my mother sold it to me for a dollar, and I polished the steps to earn the money. I had never known a book like it, a book with interjections and digressions and ponderings, one that meandered and backtracked, that bounced and hummed, that drew you in so close you felt you were in the very forest itself, and at the same time allowed you to step back and see the actual form of a book with characters so endearing you hated to leave them behind, so you didn't. I spent a year working on Finding Winnie, I traveled to England to rummage in the archives of the London Zoo, where I reveled in the daily occurrences, the zookeeper's handwritten record of comings and goings, in which, that I read, in which I read that the day Winnie arrived, it was foggy, a white-whiskered swine was unwell, and at 7 a.m., the temperature in the hippopotamus house was 54 degrees. At the War Museum, I learned that in World War I, Canadian soldiers were issued boots with cardboard soles, which disint disintegrated in the mud of the Salisbury Plain, where it rained and rained and rained. And back in the studio, I had access to Brian Floker's considerable knowledge of locomotives. <laughs> Thank goodness, because my train would otherwise have resembled a jumble of licorice. In a year which was uncommonly weighted with grief from the loss of a dear friend, Finding Winnie brought sweet distraction and great joy. One of the main reasons for the joy was working with Susan Rich. Susan introduced herself to me with a winning email. I had recently beseeched my wonderful and wise agent, Nancy Galt, don't let me take on any more books right now. Seriously, even if I tell you this one is a find, remind me that I haven't had a weekend and off in a year, that my children are withering from neglect, that I ought to be going to physical therapy. But in the face of such an email, Nancy's best efforts were a lost cause. I was a love-struck sailor hearing the sirens call. I once told my family I would sail off into the sunset with Susan Rich. They refer to her simply as Sunset. <laughs> the thing about Susan, apart from her wit, genius, humanity, grace, and humor, is that she has a fantastic voice. I would answer the phone, and an hour later, we would have covered trim sizes and train journeys, soldiers and serendipity, beloved bedraggled toys, and contents of preschoolers' pockets. We solved problems and shared stories and navigated every twist and turn together on possibly the most delightful collaboration I have ever known. I had not yet heard her voice when I read that first email. I cannot now read it any other way. Hello, Sophie. Susan Rich here with a manuscript for you to look at. This one, this story, I think, is a find. This is the sort of true story you can't believe you don't already know. Unless, well, unless you already do know it. I find nonfiction thrilling when it shows us what almost wasn't. True stories that make us see that the world as we know it came to be when someone took a chance, made a choice. I'm not going to say much more about the story, but you will see it is full of wonderful things to bring to life a sea of white tents at the army barracks, a parade of ships crossing the ocean in 1914, the London Zoo. See what I mean? Yeah. 
magic of technology. I felt a little bereft when I finally finished the book. I remember Susan and I dragged out our last conversation, ostensibly about whether the tiny graphic element on the spine should be a spot or a diamond, but it was really about our reluctance for this particular journey to be over. There's a curious lull while a book is being printed. Having raced feverishly to deadline, there are months before you actually hold the book in your hands. I took to carrying around the FNGs of Finding Winnie like an expectant parent carries a sonogram print. One day I gave a presentation to a large and rowdy group of kids. I went all out. I explained how to make a picture book. I drew for them upside down with Chinese ink. I showed them whisks from four centuries and how you can paint with squished blackberries. I took them on a journey to densely crowded dirt floor classrooms in Congo and a school in Bhutan halfway in the sky where the student population is five and the commute is a two hour vertical climb. I told them what it felt like to watch kids in Rwanda open a book for the very first time and turn the pages and look at the pictures and make out the words and how little children walked for miles to a hilltop where village elders told stories passed down through the ages. At the end, I opened it up to questions. A girl shot up her hand. Can you tell us a story? I said, a story? After all that, you want a story? Yes, came the resounding cry. Children are so demanding. Hmm. Um, Brian told me very carefully to number my pages, and I did. So I pulled up a tiny chair and took the effigies out of my bag and read Finding Winnie. You could have heard a pin drop. The principal came in halfway through and wiped a discreet tear. The teachers wept freely and reached for tissues in cavernous bags. I've read the finished book often since then, and almost every time I get to the end, a kid will ask, is Harry still alive? Even though that they know the story took place over 100 years ago. And then immediately after, is Winnie still alive? And they are crestfallen to hear she is not. Because somehow they know people get old and die, but they want bears to live forever. Occasionally I tell them that Winnie's skull is on display in London and her teeth are all rotten from the condensed milk, which is true and fascinating and slightly unsettling, like lots of the things I like. <laughs> But usually, we talk about our own stories, how we go about our lives gathering stories from daily occurrences to tell our families over dinner, or collecting stories from our evenings to tell our studio mates at lunch, how our stories intertwine and overlap, how part of other people's stories, how we are part of other people's stories as they are part of ours, no matter where we were born, who we are, or where we, were, where we live and how we pass those stories down through the ages, how long after our mementos, our dog tags, or Trevor mugs are lost or left behind, the stories will remain. How sometimes we have to let one story end so another can begin, like when we move house, or grow up, or lose someone we love. But how we will always have those stories to revisit and reread. Within the pages of a book, wherever they go, and whatever happens to them on the way, in that enchanted place at the top of a forest, a little boy and his bear will always be playing. Everything is connected. If I hadn't been bored out of my brain in my mother's antique shop, I wouldn't have resorted to a dusty book. If I hadn't encountered that book at that time, I would have been a very different child. If my mother hadn't kept me supplied with paper, I wouldn't have traced E.H. Shepard's drawings over and over again. If my father, to whom Finding Winnie is dedicated, hadn't devoted his life to books, I wouldn't have known what a good life it can be. If I hadn't won a green card in the lottery, I wouldn't be living in America. If certain cells had arranged themselves differently, I would have had other children, who I might not have liked at all, instead of Olive and Eggy, whom I love more than anything in the world. If I hadn't been dragged to a play, I wouldn't have met Ed who brings me more joy even than Susan Rich. <laughs> and I wouldn't have known his children, Jack and Beatrice, whom I adore. If I hadn't been addicted to stories of chance, I wouldn't have illustrated misconnections, and Susan would have sent someone else that seductive email. If Nancy Galt and Marietta Zacker hadn't been wonderful and wise agents, I wouldn't be here tonight. 
and if Harry hadn't got off the train to stretch his legs at a station in White River in 1914 and happened upon a bear cub, if he hadn't acted in a moment of daring, compassionate spontaneity, taken a chance, made a choice, Winnie the Pooh would not exist. To the 2016 Caldecott Committee, we are forever connected, you and I. You are my committee, and I am your medalist. To everybody I couldn't thank by name, you know who you are. <laughs> Publishers, librarians, agents, educators, booksellers, writers, and illustrators, we are all connected by our love of books and the children who read them, and our profound belief in the power of stories to shape lives. And here, now, after the recent massacre in Orlando, we are connected in grief and outrage and solidarity and love. We may never all be in the same room together again, but wherever we go and whatever happens to us along the way, I will remember you all and this enchanted evening and be grateful. Thank you.